Welcome to Cross Border Tax Talks, where we discuss the latest trends in international taxation, from U.S. tax reform 2.0 to businesses' most pressing concerns. I'm Doug McConey, PwC's U.S. International Tax Services leader. You can find these podcasts on YouTube at youtube.com slash Doug McConey. On this week's episode of Cross Border Tax Talks, we're back in our D.C. studio, where I'm thrilled to be joined by Mohammed Kandi. Mohammed is a PwC Vice Chair and the U.S. and Global Advisory Leader for PwC. His technical knowledge spans the areas of operational strategy, technology development, mergers and acquisitions, and operations management. Mohammed, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Doug. Yeah, we've been talking about doing this for a while and oh, yes. uh, very excited to, to have you to learn a little bit about what's taking place in, in the consulting business and what you're seeing. But before we dive into some of our technical content, you wrote an amazing LinkedIn post in early 2021, where you describe yourself as a black man, an immigrant, and that you speak English with a French accent. I still have the French accent, yeah. I can confirm all three of us. <laughs> um, I'd encourage our listeners sincerely to, to actually read it in entirety. But maybe start with what might people learn from your journey, starting with the Ivory Coast to France, to Montreal, one of my favorite cities in North America, and ultimately the U.S. Well, you know, as you know, I've been around the block and uh, living in many different countries. And I will say that really the big takeaway from, uh, for me, knowing that I've been on both sides of, I won't call the racial divide, but of uh, being a minority, but also being in, my, you know, in the majority, because I grew up in the majority. Sure. So it gave me a different perspective of, you know, people, how they behave and also what matters. <clears throat> and I would say that the biggest learning for me was the first thing not to judge people, get to l listen to them, learn about them. But the second thing was trust in yourself. Because when you trust in yourself, eventually things go well. That are the two major learnings. But the listening part was the most important thing for me. I'd, uh, I travel around the world and grew up in all these different uh, places, but listen to people, get to learn from them. Were there any particular people, mentors, sponsors? Talk a little bit about that, because I, I had a podcast on uh, talking about the profession of international tax with one of our newly minted partners who, who spoke a lot about the importance of mentorship and, and sponsorship. And what, what does that mean to you, and how has that helped you through your career? I would say that throughout my careers, I've had actually quite a few mentors. You know, when I was in Motorola, for example, I moved from, um, from Montreal to um, to the US, to mm -hmm. Chicago, to work for Motorola. And the person that took a chance with me uh, when I was an engineer in Motorola to move me to the US and to, uh, to, uh, to work in, in Chicago. And that person was a great mentor because not only they took a chance, but they spent a lot of time with, with me to help me understand US customs, mm -hmm. uh, the ways of working, and social norms, you name it, right? Because they're a little bit different from what I've uh, uh, I knew about in, uh, in Africa and also in Europe. So, and as I continue to progress with my careers, I've been lucky, honestly. I've been lucky to have some very good mentors. Mm -hmm. And there were mentors that did things for me, even when I was not watching, mm -hmm. even when I didn't see what they did for me. There were advocates behind closed doors, and they were the greatest mentors because they didn't expect anything in return. Yeah, I think that that's critically important. and. And one of the things that Mohammed, I, I, I have been thinking a lot about, particularly in our international tax business, is how is that changed or how is that changing with this whole work from home environment and experience? And I think about you know, the people that were really influential to my career and those mentors and the time we got to spend together and spending time in the office. And you know, I do have some concerns like how does that change and making sure that we can still have those appropriate touch points you know, and create the, the, those connections, right, in a, in a work from home and environment. And which I think is challenging, it just requires people to be much more mindful and frankly proactive in some of their, their mentorship to be able to continue to create those connections. But I do wonder, you know, not just with PwC, but from corporate America as a whole, you know, how will that fundamentally change kind of how we interact, how we mentor, how we teach, you know, obviously I work in a very technical area and those touch points are just really, really important. And, and now they're virtual touch points many times instead of in-person touch points. I couldn't agree more with you because I would tell you, I truly believe in mentorship, 
but also the apprenticeship model, right? Mm -hmm. Where we spend time with people that are more uh, junior in a, when it comes to their careers and spending time with them to mentor them. And you're right, virtual mentorship needs to be very, very intentional. Yeah. It cannot just be left to, to, to any random event, right? So we just have to be more intentional now. We have enough technology that we can use today to help people build relationships, but the key thing is to be very intentional about it because you know when we show up in the office, we get not opportunistic mentorship, I would say. Right. That doesn't happen anymore. It has to be proactive. And if not only for the mentors, but also the mentees, I mean, uh, we just have to be very proactive about it because we just don't, this, this immediate reaction, this immediate real-time real feedback mm -hmm. is more difficult to it provide is. now than yeah. it was before, so yeah. Good and there needs more. to be a push and a pull. Yeah. All right, so uh, let's dive into to some of the technical content. Really wanted to spend some time talking about some of the trends in, in multinational businesses and certainly can add some flavor from a tax perspective. Um, but let's start with platforms, yeah. right? This is a, is a big trend, the platform business model. So maybe if you could tell us what, what we're hearing, we hear a lot about this. Um, I've got a very tax audience here. So maybe we just start with what is a platform and why are we seeing this really across sectors and industries, really kind of a, a fundamental change to a number of different business models. And then we can dive into some of the other trends that we're seeing. You know, today we have two different types of business models. We have the linear business models, which are the business models of the past, where like let's say manufacturing, where you have to manufacture goods, and the bigger your factory is, the more economies of scale you get. But the economies of scale are more on the supply side mm -hmm. of the equation. The platform business models are business models where the economies of scale are driven on the demand side, which means that the more customers or the more consumers you are, companies are getting on the platforms, the, the lower the marginal cost of acquiring these customers. And that is why the company that have the platform business models today are the one driving uh, really extraordinary valuations today in the market compared to the linear business model where basically companies have to spend a lot of money before they start generating revenues. That's the, the reverse on the platform side because that we make a lot of money before they even have to spend any money. So very different way of organizing. And the reason why a lot of the platform business models today are very capex light but also very asset light compared to the linear business mm -hmm. models. But they invest a lot uh, in our research and development, but it's more technology based. So there is always technology be behind the platform business model. And to your point around taxes, you know, the amount of R&D that we see that is being spent by a lot of the platform companies, it's a lot because they, con they have to continue to innovate. And that innovation is more on the technology side, mm -hmm. but not on the asset side. The very, they tend to be asset like that business models. So, yeah, can you? I mean, because it's very obvious to me that we see that in the technology sector. I think of, for example, app stores, right, across a number of different companies where very asset light, right? People put apps on the app store, customers can, can simply download those and just doesn't require the, the, the massive factories. Um, but it, it seems that there's also a trend to, to focus on this demand, demand side, even for you know, historic industrial type companies. And as you know, I'm a Midwest guy, so that's been a lot of time. And you know, companies that actually make stuff and sell tangible goods. And so how do you take that concept that we've seen that's very prevalent again in like the technology industry, and, and we're seeing you know, other more historic kind of brick and mortar companies transition to that. Tell us a little bit about about how that works. So what we are saying is that the, the brick and mortar type companies today, the big manufacturing companies or producer of goods are participants on the platforms because they have to bring all the, the services and the goods on, on the platforms. The owners of the platform are the companies that not only maintain the technology or own the technology, but they have the ability to help other companies to come on the platform to transact on the platform. Mm -hmm. That's one of the critical things that you need in a platform business model giving the, the, the ability for consumers, but also suppliers, to come on the platform and transact on the platform. So the payment systems are very, very important. Mm -hmm. That's, that's uh, one of the criteria when it comes to platforms. But the manufacturers or the producers of goods are participants on the platforms. So they cannot just tend to make a lot more money also by participating on the platforms. Mm -hmm. 
But the revenue side is very different from the valuation side. The platform companies tend to get a, a much higher valuation than the other linear type companies, mm -hmm. even though they all tend to actually you know, generate a lot more money, a lot more profits by being participants on the platform. So again, very big difference between the revenue generation, but also the valuation that companies are commanding in the market today. Sure, and, and presumably those historic manufacturing companies, those CEOs are taking note of these extraordinary valuations and multiple of earnings and looking to, to try to adopt similar, similar models. Absolutely. And the, the other trend that is happening is that some of the platform companies today are seeing that a lot of the companies that are producing and trading on the platforms stand actually to generate so much revenue that they want to participate themselves. So they are extending themselves, not only being a platform company, but we are actually now seeing many of the platform companies getting more and more into brick and mortar type businesses mm -hmm. because for them they see that there is value to be gained also in, a, in a, by being a producer also of goods. And you see that with some of, some of the recent moves in the industry today. Yeah, there are massive investments taking place, um, and we're going to dive into some of the specific areas of, of transformation. But you, you had made a point, you, you had already mentioned, you were the first person to mention tax on this podcast, yeah. which I'm, I'm pretty <laughs> pleased with, I think, other than my, my introduction. Uh, but but you're, you're spot on as companies are thinking about you know, these major investments. The first thing to think about, which is, I think, obvious for many, many, many tax folks, is just the incentives that are available, whether it's in the U.S., across the globe, um, you know, whether it's federal, state, and local, and as companies are making these investments, thinking about, well, what are those opportunities? What are those incentives that are available to try to minimize the after-tax cost of, of these investments? The other thing that we're seeing, particularly a lot in the international tax business as a trend is, well, if these massive investments are taking place, where do you fund them? Yes. Right? Is it funded out of the U.S.? Is it, is it funded outside the U.S.? Is there an IP strategy? And we've had, uh, we had a podcast on ESG, which we'll talk a little bit about, where companies are making these massive investments and where you fund those and how you fund those can have a very different tax result, depending if you're funding those in a high tax jurisdiction, you certainly need to think about deductibility, but if there's really this massive opportunity for growth and future profits, to the extent that you can do that in a lower tax, lower cost environment, then you're gonna simply help your, your after-tax returns. Yeah, and we actually, the point that you just made is, uh, is, is real because we see that. You know, going back to the platform uh, uh, topic, the amount of investment that's being made, the amount of innovation that is required when it comes to technology, and when you say technology, you talk about IP. Unfortunately, the conversation about IP and where the IP needs to reside is after the fact, and many companies could stand to benefit a lot if they were having that conversation with tax in the room about the, the IP strategy, where the IP needs to reside. And more companies are becoming clever and clever about this because they have to also think about where the people that need to create or innovate on that IP need to be. Not just where the IP resides, but where do the people need to be. Yeah, th that's exactly <coughs> right. And if you, if you would go back 10 or 15 years, really before U.S. tax law changes and frankly the rest of the world has caught up, you know, companies could find a, low, a very low tax or no tax jurisdiction Invest, to, um, invest through that low tax jurisdiction and try to generate a lot of those profits. Well, given the changes in US tax laws with guilty, given the changes just across the globe, anti-hybrid, we are now um, dealing with the OECD, kind of yep. uh, BEPS 2.0 and Pillar 2. And so you, the, the conversation that we have from a tax perspective really has fundamentally changed and you hit it on the head is, where, where is this IP going to be used? Yep. Is it going to be used inside the U.S.? Is it going to be used That's outside right, yeah. the U.S.? Is it going to be both? How do you fund those? And most importantly, where are the people? And we talk about it from a tax perspective is where is the substance? Because the days of trying to generate IP in some low tax jurisdiction and you have your substance in a high tax jurisdiction are mostly over. Exactly. Absolutely. And so it really requires a conversation with the business, right? Because you just can't have a bunch of pointy head tax nerds like myself in a room developing these strategies because you need to know where is the, where is the business going, like jurisdictionally, and where are those people, how do the flows work? And it really requires a partnership and a teaming between the tax group as well, uh, along with the, the business folks. Yeah, and I would tell you that the companies that are really sophisticated about having tax or the tax professionals 
into the conversation up front are the ones that are the most successful out there. Mm -hmm. we, we see a big difference. Because you and I have the conversation before round, looking at the full P&L of organizations right above and below the line. And the company that are able to optimize the full P&L when they think about investment decisions, when they think about IP or research and development, are the companies that are very successful today in the market. Yeah, one thing I've found, Mohammed, which is interesting is, and, and we'll talk a little bit about this later, but, but tax isn't always at the table yeah. when we're talking about some of these different transformations, which we're going get, to get into. And I, I do wonder sometimes if the, the non-tax folks, the, the business people, appreciate what they're creating is actually intellectual property. You know, I think sometimes you think, well, we've developed this algorithm for our salespeople that we can use across the globe, and this is gonna help the sales folks. And this may be done just on the demand side, right, in the sales team, and it's just, a, that is a valuable piece of intellectual yeah, property. Yeah. Anytime you're investing in that, and so there needs to be a tax strategy surrounding that, you know, depending where it's gonna be used, where the people that are supporting that. And the, the other thing that I, I find interesting is that if companies are developing a lot of, of data intensive algorithms, for example, and using data, they're often looking for data scientists and hiring new people. Where you hire those people obviously has an after-tax consequence, whether they're in a high-tax jurisdiction, low-tax jurisdiction, the incentives, all the things that we were talking about funding you know, also apply to, to, to hiring people as well. You know, you point around people when you think about what just happened for the past uh, almost two years now with the, with the remote work, virtual working, etc. Now the, the location of the people doesn't matter that much, right? So companies right. can be much smarter about which jurisdiction the people need to reside. Within the US, for that matter, we can do that, but think about doing the same globally, right? And have a better tax efficient workforce strategy to think about where people need to reside, where the talent is going to be. And with the great resignation, we are actually running out of talent in some professions here in the US. So are we better off finding the talent outside of the US in other jurisdictions and accomplish the same business objectives today that many companies are going after? We are doing to the same for ourselves at PwC. For sure. You know, yeah, because we need to. Now, the, the pointy-headed tax nerd in me would, would say, like when, when I hear a business, purple, business person saying, well, we can put people anywhere, it does create potential issues, what we call permanent establishment, right? And, and yeah. figuring out, you know, if we have somebody sitting in France really focusing on the U.S. market, does that all of a sudden potentially create a U.S. tax exposure for our French subsidiary, for example? So, but, but I think we're both glass are, is half full kind of people. But that's where you need tax to be involved in the conversation so up front. Right? It, absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah. and you can put guardrails and restrictions and there are things that we can do to still optimize that manage those risks exactly. yep. and as long as the tax folks are are in the room for that we can manage we can manage yeah. that um, through a number of different mechanisms but I, i'm with you it's more opportunistic right if we have Today, this great resignation right. and we're looking to fill for example data scientists and you know focused outside the u.s and we're looking to hire people well we would prefer to hire people in a, in a lower tax jurisdiction than a higher tax jurisdiction lower tax lower cost but also more talent more capabilities right and with the balancing act that many of the businesses have to do today is to figure out, but how do you make a complete decision? Not mm -hmm. just an incomplete about, I need more people with a specific talent. The location, the talent, the cost, all this needs to be considered at the same time in a tax efficient manner. Uh, you know, one of the things that we are, you know, when we uh, talk to our clients is to make sure that when they look at a situation, they look at it completely. Mm -hmm. Because we have seen a lot of incomplete decisions where decisions they made on people side create a down, uh, downstream impact on either on the taxation sure. side, et cetera. So again, the level of sophistication to look at problems in the totality to make the, uh, to make the right decisions. Companies that are doing that, you know, are the ones that are very successful today because one, when they solve one problem, they don't create another one. And that's what we see a lot in business. That loop never closes. Right. You know, you solve one problem, you get to another one, and then you keep always chasing situations rather than sol uh, solving problems. Absolutely, and, and I can't stress enough how important it is to have tax on the table. We're Absolutely. the largest expense Absolutely. in corporate America, yeah. public or, or private, and as long as, as we have the appropriate stakeholder, stakeholders involved, right, that loop will, will continue. I couldn't agree more, yeah. All right, so let's talk about transformation. I mean, there is a lot going on in the yes. market, Mohammed, with respect uh, to transformations from you know, ERP systems to 
uh, so enterprise reporting yep. uh, to uh, ESG, which we've talked about. But, but I think the way you view transformation, we've talked about this before, is, is kind of in three broad categories, portfolio, workforce, and digital. Yes. Um, so, so maybe start off with what, what, is, what is portfolio transformation? How do, we, how do we view this? What are you seeing out, out in the, the market today with respect to how companies are changing their portfolios? So portfolio transformation is when companies basically decide which business they want to stay in and which one they want to exit. Right. And the portfolio transformation is what's driving the amount of deals activity sure. that we see today in the, in the market. A, a lot of carve outs, mm -hmm. divestitures and mergers, you name it. Right. All this is driven by the need for portfolio transformation. Right? Companies have to make a fundamental decision about what business do they choose to be in and look at the amount of activity that we have out there in the market today and also the amount of dry powder that exists because it's one thing to have assets to sell. We also need people with the liquidity to buy the assets, right? And today, we are, what we're seeing in the market is that there's two things that are coming together. A lot of assets come into the market, but a lot of dry powder also that mm -hmm. can go after the assets. Hence, the level of deals activity that we're seeing today. So that's what portfolio optimi optimization is uh, today. And we are seeing a lot of companies thinking about, again, which business they want to be in. Mm -hmm. and what part of the business they need to stay in, not only on the profitability side, but again, we always have to think about uh, shareholders' return. So valuation is extremely important. Companies are making choices of not only business that are not profitable, but which businesses they need to be in that would drive the maximum valuation for them, mm -hmm. for the, the, the stock price, et cetera. Yeah, and what's interesting to me is this is really across industries, across right? Industries. We're seeing private equity and asset wealth management, really looking at their portfolios, but also some of the largest multinationals, both US and foreign. You're right, we've seen a number of carve outs, divestitures, yeah. a lot of spin offs we see yes. from a tax perspective. Yeah. And because yeah. companies figure, would well, they decide that they want to break up their portfolios? And obviously, being able to do that in a tax efficient manner is, is really important. One of the things that I think about with, portfo with this portfolio transformation, tax is always at the it's table. Always in. It's always, always at the table. Yeah. Like companies understand, I think stakeholders understand how important the tax ramifications are for any type of acquisition, disposition, if you're trying to do a, a tax-free spinoff. And so, you know, from, from my experiences, when a CEO, CFO is making a decision with respect to their portfolio, Tax is always at the table. Tax is always at the table for portfolio optimization. There is a level of sophistication when it comes to transactions where companies know that mm -hmm. they, they need to do it in a tax efficient way. Absolutely. I wish it was the, the, the same for the, the other type of transformation though. But on the portfolio optimization side of portfolio transformation, absolutely. It's a given. It's nobody, just a given. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Nobody, nobody thinks about it twice. Yeah, you yeah, wouldn't yeah, think yeah, yeah. about yeah. thinking about a, a disposition, yeah. acquisition, merger, yeah. whatever the case yeah. may be, without bringing the tax Absolutely. people into the room. They all think about how much cash. They could have think about cash. And every time people think about cash, they have to think about tax. Right. Yeah, and, and as I reflect on my own personal career, Mohammed, I think about the, the meetings that I've had with the CEOs and the CFOs. A lot of that has been around deals, right? Because yeah. they know, like, we got to bring the tax folks in, got to think about what those, those consequences Absolutely. are. Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So let's go to the second one, which is workforce, workforce transformation. W what does that mean for us, us tax folk? Yeah, no, listen, the workforce transformation, I think we hit on it a little bit about all the challenges that are happening and in, in the world today with the new ways of working. You have new ways of working, you have the virtual work, but also you have the great resignation. We are running out of people in, cert, uh, in certain professions today. You put all these three things together, it creates massive stress in many of the companies today. So not only they cannot find the people, but the people that they find, they cannot see them or they have to work virtually. It's a different level of engagement. Mm -hmm. So, and also the Gen Z or the much younger generation entering the workforce today have very, very different aspirations about what they want to see in a company, uh, in a company that they're, they're going to join, the values, the vision of the company, so all of these factors are coming together and however we manage people before, however we did it, it's not going to be how we need to manage them in the future. Mm -hmm. We are talking about the use of technology in a very different way. The, ne the new generation coming into the workforce is very technology savvy. And any organization that is out there that, that will be able to attract them need to provide them better technology that they have at home. That's the first thing. 
So the work environment needs to be very different. Access to technology needs to be different. But also aspirations, the nature of the work that they do. Um, to be very candid, many of them get bored very mm -hmm. quickly. So how do we create mm -hmm. enough diversity in the, the work that they do so that they don't get that, um, I want to say boredom, but they, get to, they need to learn constantly. So the unit of work needs to change. The learning environment needs to be set up in a very intentional way to attract the talent. For sure. And compensation and benefits is becoming very different. It's not just now about how much we pay people. It's about how we pay them. And the combination of the experience at work, the compensation and benefits, and the culture of the organization. And how do you do that when half of the people, if not more, are working remotely? Right. We don't see them. Yeah, we talked earlier about the mentorship and apprenticeship. So how do we bring all this together? So companies now are finding out that one of the most important assets that they have, I know we talked about IP, are people. The way that the people assets have to be managed is very, very different from what we had before. We're in a very different world and we cannot use management processes mm -hmm. of, the, of the past to try to create the future. That's really what's happening today. And many companies are figuring that out. With globalization also, it creates another opportunity of virtual work for companies to say that they can extend their footprint and get talent from outside of the U.S. That's what we're seeing for. Uh, right. And, of, yeah. and, and as we discussed, I think that, you know, with workforce transformations, maybe tax might not be at the table quite a bit. I think that, you know, some of maybe the more sophisticated companies understand the potential downside that I mentioned, like with permanent establishment. But I view this as a as a more of an opportunity. We we spent a lot of time in tax talking about the value chain. Yes. Right. And you know where you have kind of the back office and lower level people is very different than when you're hiring you know C suite executives, senior vice presidents, because where those people are are hired and where they're making decisions can have dramatically Everybody different knows. tax results Absolutely. depending on, yeah. on on where where they're located. And, and so, you know, how we get tax at the table as part of those discussions, there's significant opportunities. And particularly in, in a lot of the, the companies that I'm working with, you're right, there's a lot more flexibility on where people can, yeah. can work. And so obviously understanding the risks, but looking how to, to try to optimize that value chain is, is really important. I like the way you put, you're saying it because the value chain of, <clears throat> most of the time when we think about value chain, we think about the value chain of goods. Right. services. There's a valuation of people now. Absolutely. That we need to think about. And we are seeing also companies innovating even more when it comes to the valuation of people to increase the level of productivity of their organizations by using a follow the sun strategy where they have people working together in different shifts. So they're constantly working. They're not mm -hmm. just the same people. So you actually see innovation and acceleration of a lot of uh, the investment that companies are making because they can use people from multiple locations and have them work together to using the follow the sun strategy and they're constantly working. So you see innovation accelerating because not because, uh, because people are able to work in different shifts in different countries. Absolutely. It's, it is just amazing, yeah. All right, so let's move to the, the third leg of the stool, which is digital. And we're seeing massive investments from companies, particularly related to their financial accounting systems um, and, and finance transformation. Um, but talk a little bit about what's driving that. My understanding is, and I'm gonna, I might be a little out of school here, is that a, a number of the big uh, enterprise reporting companies are requiring companies to move onto the cloud, yes. right, from I, presumably systems that historically sat behind their own firewalls. Yes. And creating just a massive uh, uh, amount of work for, for companies. But talk a little bit about digital, because I appreciate that that's really just one piece of the, the overall puzzle. Yeah, that's one piece of it. So when we think about digital transformation, we have two, two types of transformation. There is a digital transformation of the back office, as you mentioned. ERP system, enterprise reporting uh, you know, system that we have, enterprise resource planning. And you also, whether HR uh, system, finance systems, and uh, sometimes supply chain, uh, for okay. supply chain management, which we call uh, middle office. But that wave of digital transformation with a wave, a wave driven a lot also by not only the needs of the market, but company it was all a cost, of, uh, it was about cost efficiencies, for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. right? Companies needed to run the companies at a lower cost. In addition to that, a lot of the big ERP companies also evolved the, the, the portfolio of services or products that they sell, asking all of the customers today to evolve to, and migrate to the cloud. The cloud is at which, you know, overall is more secure, it's going to be, sh it's cheaper to maintain, et cetera, sure. right? 
So that wave is driven by the need for companies to be cost efficient, but also for the technology providers to say, hey, it's time to move to the cloud. Okay. This got accelerated in the last two years because of COVID, right? Because companies need to start basically running, the, running their operations without having to show up at the office. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to make payroll without going to the office. Guess what? That payroll system needs to be accessible from anywhere. You don't have to go to the office to, to sign checks, right? right? Or to make payroll. So that acceleration, what we saw of the digital transformation of uh, back office, more of an efficiency play, what we saw in the last two years, it moved from large corporations, 4,500 that were driving the, uh, the, all, the, all the different changes to small and medium, uh, mm -hmm. uh, medium businesses. So it's now across the whole industry. It's no longer the prerogative of large companies to say, I have to go, uh, to go digital. I have to digitize my back office. Everybody has to do it. Yeah. Whether you're in a restaurant, whether you're running a small you know, grocery store, you need to have your back office run with a, you know, digital technology. That's one, one part of digital transformation. The second part of digital transformation is the digital transformation of what we call the front office. How companies are developing the next generation products and services. Mm -hmm. How they interact with customers. How they transact with customers and how they deliver a very different experience. Again, this got accelerated because of COVID because we, many companies need to uh, interact with any one of us sure. through digital uh, channels. We stop going to the store, so but how do we buy? But when you think about it, digital technology is not only being used to transact with consumers and create a very different experience. Many companies are now thinking about digital transformation and embedding technology into the next generation products and services that they offer. Massive wave, and I will tell you, Doug, it is just getting started. Yeah, and, and on the, the, the front office side, as you describe it, obviously tremendous amount of tax opportunities, very similar to what we talked about in the context of, of workforce. Where are those investments taking exactly. place? Is there intellectual property yes. being developed? How is that funded? Where does that reside? Who's exploiting that, that intellectual property? I do want to go back to the back office because this is one area where I do wonder, Mohammed, is tax appropriately involved, particularly as we think about ERP design? The, the reason I mention that is because I have spent a lot of time over my career, kind of came up through the ranks doing a lot of tax compliance. And one of the challenges that we have as tax professionals, whether you're in, uh, you know, in a consulting business or whether you're at, at a client or part of the taxpayer, is getting good data or data in an appropriate form that we can then use to do our tax calculations. And as we think about companies moving from you know, their servers onto the cloud and really redesigning the ERP systems, as a tax guy, it seems like a huge opportunity to make sure that we get the tax mapping right. There is so much time, Mohammed spent, taking data that's really not in the appropriate form, and then we've got to manipulate it to be able to get it on to the tax return, or even just to do a tax provision, you know, quarterly tax provision calculations. Yeah. And it doesn't seem always that the tax has a seat at the table for, for particularly at the beginning of those conversations, because you've got to get the mapping right. But what is your experience with that, and, and how, do we, how do we get tax more engaged in those conversations earlier on? <laughs> Yes, that's a, that's a tricky one. I would tell you the opportunity is there. Unfortunately, to your point, we don't see tax engage at the front end of the major di uh, digital transformation of the back office, as you just mentioned. But it's starting, though. We are seeing a lot of cases where, I would tell you, if tax gets involved, when the business case, because for every transformation that needs to be uh, uh, implemented, there is a business case that is being put by somebody in a company, right, to say that we need to uh, digitize our back office. If we do the following, therefore, here are the gains, here are the, uh, the return on investment. Tax needs to be in that conversation. Mm -hmm. I would tell you, to, to, to your point, many of the big digital transformations that we see out there could be self-funded if we look at it above and below the line. But yeah, companies just with credits it. and incentives can pay for yeah. a huge chunk. Of, and of so many companies are delaying investment decisions around digital transformation because they're only looking at above the line. Mm -hmm. If they were looking at it above and below the line, the business case works for digital transformation. They could accelerate their own decision making and by accelerating the, the decision making, they tend to run the companies better. They're saving costs and they, you know, they're going to also generate revenues because they, they can deal with the customers in a very different way. So that acceleration of decision making 
is something that people don't think about. Mm -hmm. We have seen a lot of business cases in companies that need a digital transformation. They cannot act on it because the business case doesn't work when they look at it above the line. You look at the full PL, it makes sense. So that's what we're advising a lot of companies to always ensure that you tax professional, you tax director, you tax vice president is in the room when you decide to make a big investment decision. Mm -hmm. Just like if you were doing a deal, you would not. It would not exactly. do a deal without bringing the tax it, people. It gives a big make, investment, digital transformation. Right. Look at a digital transformation like a deal. Actually, I like that. I think I'm going to steal that. <laughs> you can. I like that. You can. Yeah, yeah. Um, for a small license. <laughs> <laughs> i got to set up my own platform here. Yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, yeah. Muhammad. Where are you going to put your IP? Right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, there was one other point that I want to make, because obviously the compliance and the provision stuff as we think about the, the ERP implementations is really important. but. When, when I think about systems design as a tax person, I really view it more as a documentation of the value chain, mm -hmm. right? And as companies are going through the process of looking at their overall ERP systems, how title flows, you know, how revenue is reported, where Recognize, payments are yep. made mm -hmm. and recognized is really important to document the value chain. And I think that in addition to just trying to minimize the costs associated with reporting whatever, that there is an opportunity as we think about the redesign, if you will, of new ERP systems, that it may create additional opportunities from a tax perspective to potentially change flows, to be able to get things more tax optimized than maybe they otherwise would. Because frankly, you know, there's been a lot of conversations that I've been a part of where the systems issue, and we talk, we hear a lot. Uh, of, we cannot do this. We cannot yeah. do it uh -huh. because there's yeah. a systems yeah. issue. Yeah. And, yeah. and and this seems like a, a really where you've got a, I don't want to call it a, quite a clean sheet of paper, but if you're really redesigning all of this stuff, it really seems like the appropriate time, again, in addition to the, the reporting aspects, really try to, to optimize the, the flows and the overall structure. You know, you're absolutely right. And that is, uh, that's where uh, cloud-based technologies also help. Because, Doug, one of the things that we're finding out, the fact that there is a big opportunity now for companies to do that, you know, to redesign the whole reporting up, the structure that they need and how the things are flowing into the system. But here, here's the here to catch. They will have to do it more often than they used to. It cannot be static anymore. Mm -hmm. Because so many, for example, supply chains today are being impacted for, by many reasons. Either because they don't have the raw materials that they need, by climate change, you see all the issues that we are around, to, uh, you know, supply chain management today around the world. A lot of uh, supply chains are being impacted because you cannot move things between Asia and the U.S., for example. Right. And so, some of the geopolitical issues. Geopolitical I spent a lot issues. of time exactly. in the consumer yeah, markets yeah. industry where Hong Kong had really been a center, and I think a lot of companies are, are looking at that in addition exactly. to the cost and near sourcing, right? As near opposed sourcing. To sourcing. So exactly. So many companies are now thinking about near sourcing strategies, not only for where they buy stuff, but also companies that are thinking about uh, near shore manufacturing operations because the cost of the supply chain is becoming untenable for many of them because the supply chain is too long. Mm -hmm. the geopolitical issues, you know, shortages, you name it, right? But also climate change. That's one thing that we are seeing today. You know, you hear about the semiconductor industry, right? About the fact that we're running out of semiconductors. Right. It's on the both side of the equation. On the demand side, there's more demand for semiconductors. Why? Because in your, in your fun, in your fridge at home, in uh, your washing machine, they're all using semiconductors. And you hear about 5G, all the big capital investment that we hear in all of the different countries, the next generation uh, wireless technology, guess what? They all need semiconductors. Mm. So the more all of these things happen, the more demand you have on semiconductors. But here, the, the, uh, the issue, the semiconductor supply chain get impacted on the supply side too, because in places like Taiwan, they run out of water. And the semiconductor fabs need a lot of water. Huge amounts, yeah. And so here we are, companies thinking about, well, I need to redesign my supply chain when it comes to semiconductors because the, the sourcing of semiconductors or the manufacturing of semiconductors have to be done in places where you can find water. That's a very different way. It's not tax efficient. It's climate efficient now. Oh, yeah. That people have to think about. Even if they are going to locations that are going to be expensive locations, the access to some of the natural resources is so important now. Then now, I will even tell you, we are hearing that we are going to have semiconductor fabs built here in the U.S. now, directly. Mm -hmm because A, we cannot afford to have such a long supply chain. We have access to water. So companies are rethinking the strategies today. 
it's just fascinating to us. Uh, yeah, and, and your, your point really resonated with me because you know I've spent a lot of time on the supply chain from a, a, t a tax perspective and having a more nimble ERP system to be exactly. able to ad adopt to exactly. those changes because yeah. that is just, I can't tell you, Mohammed, the number of times that I've heard, well, we can't do that because of the system's yeah, issues. That's and, exactly. And now the bid's yeah. not the tax people, right? This is the business people saying, hey, we need to near source something. We got to figure out how to get that into the system because we need, you know, whatever product or whatever component to be able to manufacture their product. And the transfer pricing issue that it's creating, so it's no longer about being a, having efficient supply chains. It's about having resilient supply chains, mm -hmm. right? That, that's, on the supply and demand side, people are, you know, I know we talked about ESG before, people are looking at the implication of climate change, people are looking where they're finding the talent, and all of these things are coming into consideration. So that is why you know, the digital transformation is important because also the move to the cloud provides a lot of flexibility. Mm -hmm. That's why cloud-based technology is important when it comes to, uh, to the type of work that we do today. And that agility that companies require to have is, uh, it, it's not an option anymore. Mm -hmm. It is a must. It is necessary for companies to build the technology stack, to build, a, to use technology that provide them the, f the flexibility to run the business in a very different way, depending on what comes at them. Uh, at them. So I want to come back to a, a topic to, to kind of wrap things up here that, that you had mentioned a little bit earlier with respect to kind of after-tax mentality. Um, from my experiences working with business people and working with our you know, advisory and con consulting partners, that there really appears to be what I refer to as kind of an above the line philosophy. Yes. That, that things are, are, are viewed above the line with respect to a lot of these transformations mm -hmm. that, that you, we, we've talked about. Um, and, and we all know as business people that earnings per share is not above the line. Yep. Right. Absolutely. We know that Below the line. Yeah. after cash, after tax cash flow for private businesses is after tax. And so how do we create a culture in business where and I think that we would say this both as an advisor as well as my clients and taxpayers, tax wants a seat at the table. How, how do we create and, and within the C-suite and within industry a focus more on EPS as we think about transformations or after-tax cash flow. How do we get, how do we move to that, getting below the line from from above the line? We need to get tax involved at the front end of the decision making. And I think it needs to be a push and a pull. You know, you you did a lot uh, for me by telling me about below the line uh, mm -hmm. by making me more aware of the tax implication on many of the decisions that we advise our clients to mm. take, for example. And I think that education, the tax professionals that in many of the corporations could benefit from educating the other stakeholders about the earning, to, to think more about you know, above and below the line. But that's a push for me about when it comes to educating the other executives. The pool, honestly, any CFO or COO or CIO making a decision, a big investment decision, one of the first calls they should be making should be to uh, you know, the tax leader of that organization to say, if I make the following, de the following decision, what are the earnings per share implications? What are the tax implications? Tax efficient decision making will ease a lot of the stress that we see in many organizations for them to make the decisions in a timely manner. Because the ones that don't make the decisions are the ones staying behind too. Well, we started the conversation with talking about pushing and pulling between mentors exactly. and mentees. And I think this is a perfect place to, to, to wrap it up where it's important for the business to push and pull with, with the tax folks to, to make sure that not just within deals, but throughout these various transformations that the tax has a seat at the table. Absolutely. So Mohammed, great discussion. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you for having me today. So thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Cross Border Tax Talks. Thanks again to Mohammed Kandi, a PwC Vice Chair and our Global Advisory Leader for PwC. I'm Doug McConey, PwC's International Tax Services Leader in the US. Stay tuned in two weeks for another exciting edition of the Cross Border Tax Talks podcast.
This podcast is brought to you by PwC, all rights reserved. PwC refers to the U.S. member firm or one of its subsidiaries or affiliates and may sometimes refer to the PwC network. Each member firm is a separate legal entity. Please see www.pwc.com slash structure for further details. This podcast is for general information purposes only and should not be used as a substitute for consultation with professional advisors.